Uh, the uh, talks today uh, begin the rotator cuff discussion, and we're going to begin with Don Buford, who's going to talk to us about uh, his experience using ultrasound for the evaluation of rotator cuff. Don. So the topic of this talk is our 13-point shoulder ultrasound exam that Dr. Ben Dubois and I really uh, talked about for six, seven months, and then finally wrote it down on a piece of paper about two and a half, three years ago. And our design and our, our goal was really to have an, an ability to image structures in two planes using ultrasound, to have a, a format that was simple, reproducible. It gave us easy patient positioning, both in patients with painful shoulders, like they all have when they come see us, but also particularly in the post-surgical patients. So in that sense, this protocol is a little bit unique compared to the many other protocols that are out there that aren't really designed by orthopedic surgeons. And then finally, we wanted something that was really easy to teach and relatively easy to remember, and that's where we came with the 13-point 13 uh, 13 exam. Points one through five, we split off to cover just the anterior shoulder. And the structures of interest are basically inside this red box uh, that you see here. The primary anterior structures that we're looking at with ultrasound are the coracoid process, the biceps tendon, and then also the subscapularis tendon. We can also see a portion of the anterior joint as well. But these three structures really dominate the things that we're looking for in the anterior shoulder. So here at point one, we have a patient sitting on a stool, the room's darkened, whatever exam room that we're in, and you can see we have the transducer here oriented kind of transversely along the anterior shoulder, centered over the bicipital groove. On the left side here, you can see the uh, biceps tendon is, is the terminology, it's a hyperechoic structure that sits in the bicipital groove here. Cortical bone is white, so this white line is the anterior humeral cortex, and the bicipital groove is outlined right here. So medial to that, this will be the subscapularis tendon coming in. So on the, on the right over here, this is deltoid muscle up above, and then the biceps tendon on its transverse axis sits here in the bicipital groove. And that's point one. Point two, we want to look at the same structure, the long head of the biceps tendon, in its longitudinal orientation. So for orientation for everyone in the room, this is the anterior humeral cortical margin. The next structure anterior to that will be the long head of the biceps tendon. So these parallel fibers running across will be the long head of the biceps tendon. As far as patient positioning and transducer positioning, you can see the uh, transducer has been rotated 180 degrees. Um, or rather 90 degrees along the anterior shoulder, and that gives us this image of the long head of the biceps tendon running along the anterior humeral cortex. So point three, now that we've seen the biceps in two planes, point three we're going to move on and look at the subscapularis tendon. And so what doesn't show in this central picture here is that my PA there has her arm externally rotated, her elbows by her side, but she's fully externally rotated. And the reason we do that, of course, is to put the subscap on stretch which gives us a maximal diagnostic you know, sensitivity in looking at small subscap tears. And so here's the lesser tuberosity, which is the, uh, the insertion for the subscap. The uh, superior border of the subscap would be this white line here, and then above that's going to be deltoid. And hopefully these dynamic images show well. Um, if they don't, then we can come up, I guess, one at a time and look at my screen. But, um, but here you can see on a loop, one of the unique aspects of this diagnostic modality, it's a dynamic modality. So unlike MRI scanning or ultrasound or even fluoro, you can see the soft tissue in dynamic fashion. And that's something that uh, the more that I use it, the more I appreciate. And so now that we've seen the subscap at point three on its longitudinal axis, now we're going to look at the subscap on its transverse axis at point four. And so once again, we rotate the transducer 90 degrees. And it's a little bit more medial compared to the positioning for the long head of the biceps because the subscap, of course, inserts medial. And it's going to give us this image that you see here on the left or on the right side of the screen. So we orient it um, so that superior is on the left. Deltoid is going to be the tissue up here. This white line is the demarcation between the deltoid and the subscapularis tendon. And the subscap tissue is going to be here um, in between these two white lines. The inferior white line, or the inferior hyperechoic line, to use the terminology, is the cortical margin. At point five, the reason we inserted this additional point 
was because it's an, an important position to master if you're going to be doing anterior injections into the glenohumeral joint. It's also a position where you can measure the coracohumeral interval if that's um, important to you clinically. So this is the margin of the core cord, this white line here. The subscap is running along here. This is medial subscap. And you can see the patient positioning here. We've just slid our transducer a little bit more medial compared to, to point three. I think we have a dynamic picture here. So here's the core cord up above. And as the patient internally and externally rotates, you can see the, core, the uh, subscapularis as it goes underneath the core cord here. So if somebody had subcoracoid impingement, this would be the image or the, uh, the position you'd want to have the patient in in order to make that diagnosis. So that's the first five points. That's the anterior shoulder. And so now we're going to spend the next uh, four points, six, seven, eight, and nine, covering just the supraspinatus tendon. So we, we spend a lot of time just on the supraspinatus because it's so important uh, as, as shoulder surgeons for us to make the diagnosis of any supraspinatus pathology. So point six and seven cover the anterior half of the supraspinatus, shown here kind of in, in purple. And point eight and nine will cover the posterior half of the supraspinatus. So we really are able to magnify the tendon and really fine tune our diagnostic accuracy by really splitting the exam into multiple points looking at just this one tendon. So point six, we've changed our patient positioning and our patient now has her hand on her hip, her elbows tucked in as close to her body as she can get it, and the transducer orientation is parallel to a line that connects uh, what would be her contralateral shoulder to her ipsilateral hip. So in this example, on a left shoulder, this transducer is parallel to this line connecting her right shoulder to her left hip, okay? When we do that, it gives us this pretty image that you see here where this white line is the superior border of the, of the greater tuberosity. So this is the rotator cuff footprint along here. You can see how the normal supraspinatus tapers down to a point laterally. This is lateral, medial is gonna be over here. This white line is the superior border of the supraspinatus tendon. So between that white line and the, uh, the tissue above, which is deltoid, is the, subscap is the uh, subacromial bursa. And in a normal subacromial bursa, you can see there's essentially no fluid. It's a potential space. Here's a dynamic image just showing a patient abducting. And we can, we can watch here as we see the supraspinatus as it tucks back under the acromion. You can also see here there's no additional fluid in the, uh, in the subacromial space. So point seven, now we're going to look at the uh, posterior aspect of the supraspinatus tendon. So the transducer is oriented along that same line, so right shoulder to left hip, and all we've done is we've slid this transducer a little bit posterior lateral to show us the posterior half of the supraspinatus tendon. You'll also notice some changes in the footprint as you slide posterior as uh, you get to the posterior aspect of the supraspinatus insertion. So now we're going to look at the supraspinatus on its uh, sagittal axis, what would be equivalent to a sagittal MRI scan. And so we orient this on a left shoulder, so the biceps tendon, which is right here. Biceps tendon is on the left side of the screen, so this is anterior. These two kind of parallel hyperechoic lines, this is the superior border of the bone, and this is the superior border of the supraspinatus tendon. So those partial tears or those small full thickness tears that we all see in the supraspinatus tendon often occur just posterior to the biceps. So here's biceps, rotator interval, and just posterior to the rotator interval is where we spend a lot of time with ultrasound looking for any partial tears or, or small full thickness um, supraspinatus pathology right, right in this area here. We've changed the orientation of the transducer here. So now the transducer is parallel to a line that connects the same side shoulder to the opposite hip. So if you think about Rambo or a gunslinger's ammo belt, those are the two X's across the front of the shoulder. And those are the two lines that we, that we try and parallel, depending on if we're looking for a transverse or a, a coronal or a sagittal view of the supraspinatus tendon. Here we have the, uh, the transducer oriented along that same line connecting that left shoulder and right hip. And all we've done is we've slid the transducer a bit more posterior, and that gives us an image of the posterior aspect of the supraspinatus tendon. So this is all still supraspinatus. We haven't touched the infraspinatus yet. Haven't seen it yet. On this image here, this is deltoid up above. Subacromial space would basically be this white line here. And again, in its normal state, there's no fluid there. Supraspinatus tendon is between these two white lines and then humeral head is down below. 
It's really not much time to talk about pathology, but just know that if there's, if there's tears in the tendon, we're looking for dark areas on ultrasound. So we're looking for areas where there's no signal at all, and that represents usually tendon uh, pathology, whether it's a tear or fluid or things like that. So now we're going to move on to points 10 through 12, and as you would imagine, they cover the posterior aspect of the shoulder. So now we're going to look at the infraspinatus. So now we're looking at this tendon back here. So you can see the transducer as a result is just below the acromial spine here on the posterior aspect of her shoulder. This is the insertion laterally of the infraspinatus. The white line is the cortical margin. The outer border of the infraspinatus would be this line coming along here. If we do it dynamically, you get this pretty picture here as she internally, externally rotates. We'll do that one more time so I can give you a freeze shot here. Okay, so there's a good picture. So here, um, jumping the gun a little bit, but this is a portion of the glenoid. That's really the only portion of the glenoid that you can see by ultrasound. This hyperechoic triangular structure here is what you would imagine it is. It's the posterior labrum, okay? This is infraspinatus muscle here, and it tapers down and becomes tendon and inserts over here laterally. So for posterior injections, the orientation of our needle is going to be coming right down, aiming for the labrum. And you can guide those injections beautifully with ultrasound. And so now we'd like to look at the infraspinatus in uh, the equivalent of a sagittal view. And so we turn the transducer 90 degrees, and now we can see the infraspinatus on its sagittal axis. So this would be superior over here, inferior is going to be over here. And we're looking for hypoechoic defects in the tendon. We're looking for dark areas in the tendon, okay? Point 12, we've added because of the importance of doing um, intraarticular injections and visualizing the joint, uh, visualizing the needle ent entering the joint. And so we turn the transducer again back so it's oriented kind of transversely across her posterior shoulder and we, we slide that transducer a bit medial. And that gives us this view of the glenoid, humeral head, and, and like I showed before, the labrum is going to be this kind of hyperechoic white structure, triangular structure, just coming off the glenoid here. And so as we look at it once again on its imaging, okay, so this is going to be labrum right here. This will be humeral head. This is going to be infraspinatus coming across and turning into muscle as we go medially. So I'm not sure what's going on with this guy. But point 13 is the AC joint. And to look at the AC joint, we place the transducer directly over the AC joint. Uh, this is useful sometimes if patients have a real oblique joint, you're trying to do an injection, or if you just want to see if there's a lot of fluid around the joint. Um, you can't really see the inferior aspect of the joint because you lose the signal, so you don't have a lot of resolution um, deep. But you can certainly see the, uh, the clavicle in this example medially. You can see the joint capsule. Um, you can see a bit of fluid in this example around the joint. You can see the acromia in here laterally. And so that would be the 13th point on the 13-point uh, exam. So there have been lots of published papers using ultrasound for diagnosis of rotator cuff pathology. Probably the largest published meta-analysis was done by uh, Nazarian's group out of Thomas Jefferson University, and that was published back in the summer of 2009 in the American Journal of Radiology. And what they did was they, they kind of compiled 65 published studies. All of them had surgery as the uh, final outcome. And with those 65 studies, what they found was ultrasound was equal to MRI scan uh, for sensitivity and specificity and accuracy in diagnosing full thickness rotator cuff tears. Um, in the same study, they also found that MR arthrogram was a bit more sensitive and specific and accurate than both MRI and ultrasound, which is, I guess, what we would expect. Uh, the one big caveat to that is it's in the hands of a well-trained clinician, just like anything else. Uh, you have to spend time to, to train and to learn how to use the modality, but once you do, I think this is a great tool, uh, particularly around the shoulder, but there's applications for all joints in the body. Thank you very much.